Good morning, good morning, and welcome to another week of CMA Studio Summer Session. My name is Joyce Beyer, and I'm excited to be here to give you the inside scoop on some of the music being played by the Bellin Quartet this week. Uh, friendly reminder before we get started, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comments section of this video. I'll get to them as soon as I can. And if you notice that there is someone who maybe would love to watch this video, but they're not watching it right now, you can tag them in that comment section so they can see it easier later. After the video, be sure to stick around. I'll give you some more information on how you can win some free tickets to an upcoming concert. Well, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get going. All right, week eight. Let's start off by talking about our goals for today. Goal number one, I want you to be able to say at the end of today, I can describe some of specifically a part of the bowed string family. You can see some bows hanging in the background over here. And we use those bows to pull the strings as opposed to like a guitar that would just strum. Um, so when we talk about the parts of the violin, a lot of these parts are actually the same as what you would see on a viola and a lot of similar ones to what you'd see on the cello. Um, this is the body of the violin here. Up here is the scroll. And you can see the scroll has kind of a cool little pattern to it. Really, people who made violins, they carved cool things in the scroll because they could. Um, that was the purpose of it. There's not a whole lot other in purpose to why this looks so pretty. Um, we have the neck here, and that's usually what we hang on to when we're not playing. We have the fingerboard, strings, bridge, tailpiece, chin rest down here. Um, and that's just a really quick overview. But I want to talk to you about some of the parts of the violin, especially the ones that kind of relate to where our strings are and how we're able to create sound. So first on that list is the bridge. Um, I have a picture of a bridge here that you can see, but you can also see that the bridge is located here on the violin. Um, bridges are made out of wood and they hold the string up so that that string is not you know, laying against the violin. If it were laying against the violin, you wouldn't be able to make them vibrate. So the string, the bridge is here to help hold those up. Um, a lot of people think that this bridge is glued down, but it is not. I'm actually gonna show you. I can take it off just by sliding it. Now, if you have a violin, viola, cello, bass, do not do this. Do not take your bridge off. I'm a trained professional. I do this all the time. So I know how to do it safely and how to put it back up. Um, but what I wanna show you is, look, there's nothing that was there holding it. There's a little bit of a mark where it used to be. And usually our bridge kind of lines up where these little, little dashes are on our F holes. And that's where you can line the bridge back up. Um, it's a kind of cool looking design. The one on a cello, this part in the middle looks like a heart, which I think is really pretty. But its main goal is to just hold up those strings because you can see now they're touching the fingerboard. So they wouldn't really make any noise if I tried to play. The next thing we're gonna talk about are these up here. And these are called the pegs. And the pegs are here basically to hold the string in place in the peg box, but also to help us tune. So we can turn them. Again, if you have a string instrument at home and you have not worked on tuning, don't do this. This is one of the first things I tell students, please don't touch the pegs. Because if you aren't careful, you can very easily break a string and strings are not cheap. So I'm gonna take this one here and I'm turning it towards me which is loosening it and you can see the string can actually come all the way off and the peg can come out of the peg box so there's a little hole there and that's how the string goes through and that's how it holds it up here um, like I said we also use these to tune so if we loosen the string it makes the sound lower if we tighten the string it makes the sound higher but I also said this, you have to be really careful with them. If you turn them even that much, you could break it. They don't work the same as maybe like a guitar peg. Guitar pegs have a little mechanism in them. They're called mechanical pegs. So they turn a lot slower. Even if you're turning like this, the string doesn't move as much. Um, but pegs are very important for us to be able to play our instrument. 
The next part I'm going to talk about is this right down here. This is called the tailpiece. And the tailpiece exists basically to hold the other end of the string onto the violin. So we have them hooked up here at the pegs, we have them hooked down here at the tailpiece, and the bridge goes in the middle. Um, tailpiece Tail pieces can come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. I have a couple of different options there that you can see. Um, this one happens to have fine tuners in it. So this helps me do little tiny movements of strings. Um, but if you look at like my viola, a lot of instruments maybe only have one fine tuner and that one's not built into my um, tail piece. It's just something that you can add in after the fact. So. These are some of the parts I think that are more interesting about the violin because like I said, they have to do with how we get our sound um, and how the strings are attached to the instrument. You can actually take all of these things off. I took off the peg, I could take off the tailpiece. You can take off a chin rest, theoretically. Slides right off, I loosened it earlier. And then all you have is the basic box of the violin, um, which means that you can actually customize a lot of these things. All of these are what originally came with this instrument because um, that's all that's needed. But for people who play a lot, it's really important that you get a chin rest that feels really comfortable. You can get a tail piece that works the best for your instrument. Um, you can get the right kind of strings that you like the sound of on your instrument. So it makes the violin or any of string instruments really customizable, which is really kind of fun. All right, we talked about a few of the different parts of a violin, time to go on to meet our composers. So we have two composers today, both of whom are very interesting individuals. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about, oh, sorry, we're gonna review. I almost went on without reviewing. Um, so if you've been joining us, you probably don't even need this review, but just in case, a composer is a person who writes music. So we talk about these composers, um, because we want to learn a little bit more about them. We want to learn why they wrote the music they did, when they wrote it, where they're from. It makes the music a little more interesting. So the first one we're going to talk about is Tchaikovsky. Uh, he has a big, long name. He's from Russia. And he's a composer that I've actually seen several different spellings of his name. Um, and I think that be is because of where he's from and the Russian alphabet. Sometimes when we translate things from a language that uses a different alphabet, we can get different spellings of it. So this is the normal spelling I've seen, but you might actually see a different spelling too. He lived from 1840 until 1893, composed in what we consider the Romantic era, which is classical music. Um, and he is a very popular composer. Uh, you will hear a lot of symphonies play things by him. You'll hear a lot of quartets play things by him. I think his music is something that all people, they really enjoy. They think it's fun to listen to, has a lot of energy. Um, one of the things that he is most known for, I think, is the ballet. Um, he, like I said, he wrote for symphonies. He wrote for string quartets. Um, but he also wrote some of the most popular ballets that have ever existed. Um, some of the ones he wrote were The Nutcracker. He wrote Swan Lake which there's a movie called Black Swan that is about that one. Um, he wrote Sleeping Beauty, which they actually used in the Disney movie version of Sleeping Beauty. They use a theme that Tchaikovsky wrote. Um, so I know growing up, I remember going to see the Nutcracker around the holidays all the time. And I have a younger sister who was in it and she was one of the, the mice and then she was a rat. Lots of different types of things. So I think even here in Des Moines, you can find a production of The Nutcracker or you can find one, a version of it that you can watch on the TV. And that is all written by Tchaikovsky. Some really beautiful music. A little bit more about Tchaikovsky. He played the piano and he started at age five. So he was pretty young when he started playing. Um, something I thought was kind of fun. Apparently he was good. He was not a bad pianist. He was not a bad composer, obviously. But all of his friends and family, and even his teachers, never thought that he would be as popular as he was or as successful as he was as a composer. They were like, oh, he's good, but I don't think he really wants to do this. And he ended up being this composer that so many people love and program all the time and play all the time. Um, 
kind of going into that, apparently when he first graduated, he worked in the Ministry of Justice. He didn't like go into music school right away. He just got a job. Um, and then later on, he ended up taking classes at the Russian Musical Society. And that's where I think he started to get more passionate for writing music and started creating some of the things that we know and love today. Now, we're going to talk about a very different composer now. And that person is Caroline Shaw. Um, she is from North Carolina. So that's here in the United States, very far away from Russia. Uh, she was born in 1982, and she's still alive today, which I also think is really fun when we talk about classical composers who are still alive today, living composers, because I think sometimes we get in our heads that classical music is just stuff from a really long time ago. Um, and that's not true. Classical music is still alive today, and it's always changing and always growing. A little bit more about her music career. She started the violin at age two, so really young. Apparently her mom was her first teacher. And she started composing, writing music when she was 10 years old. She has attended um, some really good schools and good programs. She went to Rice University, which is in Texas. She went to Yale and she went to Princeton. And uh, she apparently is still involved or has been involved with a lot of different types of ensembles. Um, so in addition to um, playing the violin, I, she also sings. And so she has been involved as a musician, not just in writing music, but in performing music and being a part of creating music that way. Um, some more fun facts about Caroline Shaw. She was the youngest person to win a Pulitzer Prize in music. Um, and she won it when I think she was 30 years old. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, and I think that says a lot about the type of music that she's creating. It's not just that it sounds beautiful. It's kind of new and innovative. It's something different than maybe we've heard before. Um, and I think that's part of why she was able to win this Pulitzer Prize. She has also done things outside of music. She was in a TV show called Mozart in the Jungle, which was pretty fun. Um, and she co-produced a remix with Kanye West. So uh, again, I love hearing about composers that are alive today, and I love hearing about musicians, especially classical musicians, who do things outside of what we consider the norm in classical music, because I think there's a lot more of like mixing of genres now than there used to be, and people who are really skilled can enjoy all different types of music. Okay, we talked about the composers. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the music you're gonna to hear today. So comparing these pieces, one of the pieces you're gonna hear is the Sleeping Beauty Waltz by Tchaikovsky. And as I said before, that is from his ballet. Uh, it's really pretty, it's fun. And if you have ever seen the Disney movie, Sleeping Beauty, they use that theme there. It's the theme for uh, Once Upon a Dream. So if you wanna you know, get prepared for this concert, you can always watch a Disney movie ahead of time so you can hear that and know what it sounds like. Um, the other piece by Tchaikovsky you're going to hear is his string quartet in D. It has four movements, so it follows your pretty stereotypical string quartet form. Um, I have the movements listed out there, and those movements basically tell us how fast or how slow things are going to be. I would say that of this quartet, one of the most famous movements of it is the second movement, and it's slower, but it's really beautiful. And this theme that he created there is something that, even though it was written for string quartet, now people have made arrangements for solo instruments to play it or arrange it in other ways so you still get that beautiful theme but not necessarily with a full string quartet. The piece by Caroline Shaw that you're gonna hear is called Valencia and it is totally different from the Tchaikovsky's that you're gonna hear. And actually totally different from a lot of the music that you've heard so far in this concert series. Um, so I, in a lot of the pieces that you hear, we hear this very clear, it's a melody with a bunch of supporting roles. And what I think is cool about this piece that she wrote, Valencia, it uses a lot of different kind of like, I use the terms textures and colors. Um, so she uses instruments to do different things, not just play your traditional melodies, but play kind of cool sound effects. You'll hear some harmonics. You'll hear a lot of like sliding around. You're gonna hear plucking from different instruments um, while you're hearing things played with the bow. And I think that creates a lot of interesting things that kind of play with each other instead of, one unified thing that you hear. So as you're listening to it, kind of look around, see what the different members of the quartet are doing with their bows, see what they're doing with their fingers, see if you can figure out who has the melody and what the different parts are bringing to the whole piece. All right, talked about a lot, learned a lot. Let's go back to our goals and see if we met them. 
So goal number one was I can describe some of the different parts of the violin. We talked about a lot of them. I have the slide that has all of the parts, but we primarily talked about the ones that help hold the string in place so that we can play music. Uh, goal number two was I can compare and contrast composers Shaw and Tchaikovsky. Very interesting people from very different time periods and very different places. And I think when you listen to their music, you're going to hear a lot of differences in what you hear as well. Uh, hopefully you learned something new today. Thanks so much for joining. Okay, so just like every other week, not only do we have this live stream for you and the, the lesson about the music you're gonna hear, but we have an activity that you can do. So if you go to our website and click on education, uh, we have an activity for this week's um, concert. You can print it out, do it along with the music, um, but be sure to tune in to that concert. It's at 6 p.m. And if you miss the live stream, that's okay. The nice thing about technology these days is if you don't catch it right when it first starts, you can always come back and watch it. We leave them up for the full week. If you end up doing this activity, take a photo of yourself, send it to us at info at civicmusic.org, and you'll be entered to win some free tickets for an upcoming concert this year. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. See you next week.